Okay, I think I think we should start um, as others come along, they can join us. Um, so hello everybody, good afternoon or good morning, um, depending from where you are joining us. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this session on security risk management in the changing global and humanitarian context. My name is Lisa Riley. I'm the executive director of GISF, Global Interagency Security Forum. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about us later for those of you who don't know about us. Um, it would be great to know who is joining us today. So if you've not yet done so, do please introduce yourself in the chat. We are very pleased that this year, for the first time, security risk management, and in particular, integrating security risk management across humanitarian action, has been recognised as a priority topic here at HNPW. The objective of this session and the various other sessions under this theme throughout the next three weeks is to provide an overview of security risk management in the current global context for humanitarian response. The global context in which humanitarian action is implemented is changing, and despite growing concerns about the number of incidents affecting aid workers, there continues to be a gap in understanding around security risk management in our sector. The tendency for siloing reduces the effectiveness of security risk management and its ability to sustain safe access to populations in need. For security risk management to be effective, it needs to continue to evolve and reflect the changes in global context and approaches to humanitarian action. For example, increased localization, changes in technology, etc. If we are going to achieve this, we need to have better, communica better communication across the sector. This session will provide an opportunity to bring together different perspectives and to provide a broad understanding of the challenges and opportunities we face when developing and implementing effective and appropriate security risk management measures. So our agenda for the session this afternoon, um, if Laura can share the agenda. Um, after the induction, we will have, i um, very pleased to have Hugo Slim here to do the keynote address. Um, and then following that, we will have a session around what does security risk management look like now and what might it look like in the future. And with a short presentation, we'll also do a poll. We're really hoping that this will be an interactive event and would very much like to have your inputs and your perspectives on the topics as we discuss them. Um, for our panel discussion, we have three great speakers um, joining Hugo. We have Fadi Haliso. Fadi is the CEO and co-founder of the NGO Basma and Zaitona. Um, an organization dedicated to support Syrian refugees uh, and their hosting communities in Lebanon, Turkey, and Iraq. We also have Christine Perso, who works as a consultant on risk, security, and safeguarding leadership. And Fergus Thomas, who's a humanitarian advisor in the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And then finally, in this session, we will do small breakout groups because we really want to get your ideas on how we can break the silos and make security more accessible across humanitarian action. Um, as always at these events, we do have some housekeeping rules. Um, so the session will last 90 minutes. Uh, if you haven't yet done so, as I said, do please introduce yourself in the chat. The session is being recorded. It's the plenary session is recorded. What happens in the groups um, isn't recorded. And the recording is provided to HNPW, which will be added to their website. As mentioned, it is an interactive event. So do take part, do ask questions, um, take part in the poll and the small groups. It would be great if you could turn your camera on so we can see who we're talking to. Um, and this is particularly important in the breakout rooms because it does encourage uh, discussion. If you do have any technical questions or issues, you can reach out to the GISF production in the chat and they should be able to help you. 
Um, and for those of you who are interested, you can earn a H pass um, badge for this event. Great, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll just talk a little bit about GISF for those of you who don't know who we are. Um, we are a networking organization um, currently with more than 125 member organizations, but our network expands beyond that and includes experts also from the UN, um, academia, governments um, and the private sector. And we try and use that, that sort of body of knowledge to really drive the development of good practice um, for security risk management with the aim of improving access to populations in need, remembering that this is, you know, security is about enabling the programs that we do, um, not about sort of preventing them and being risk averse. So on that note, um, I would like to um, welcome our keynote speaker, Hugo Slim. Um, Hugo has worked within the humanitarian sector for quite a while now and brings a wealth of experience on the challenges faced as well as opportunities for growth in the sector. He is currently a senior research fellow at Blavatnik School of Government in the University of Oxford. We should have time for a couple of questions uh, for Hugo after his presentation. So if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat. So on that note, over to you, Hugo. Lisa, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I'm not a security expert by any means. And I've been asked to give a big picture on, on the security situation, global security. So that's what I'll try and do. But it's a pleasure to be here and to, to see so many people involved from the security sector around humanitarian action. So thank you. And of course, just to remind ourselves what we're talking about, we're talking about keeping people safe when they're engaged in humanitarian action around the world. And therefore it's important to start, I think, by remembering that in 2019, 125 humanitarian workers were killed and 404 were directly affected in security incidents. And so we're talking about people who are the victims of shooting, of bombing, um, often aerial bombing these days again. We're talking about people who are kidnapped. And we're talking about 94%, 94% of those people as national humanitarians, not international humanitarians. And of course, many more people experience these kind of events, but don't report them, different kinds of assaults, threats, whatever. So that's what we're about. And I should start by saying I've had a very safe humanitarian life. Uh, a lot of it spent in libraries, of course, at universities, um, which are not notoriously dangerous. So I'm not best placed to speak, um, but you all are. So I'll try and make some general points. I've also had quite a long humanitarian life, probably because it's been largely spent in libraries. And therefore, when I started in the 1980s, I started really in, in war zones in 1985, security was really not a big priority issue. And it was an oral culture. So, I mean, if we were briefed at all, we tended to be briefed with an oral briefing, try not to do this, don't do that, don't go there and uh, shut the door sort of thing. So it was a very different scene back then. I think it really began to get serious in the nineties in Somalia and in the Bosnian war. And then I remember really the first manuals emerging sort of 2000, 2001, Mark Cutts, who's in Gaziantep today, um, with Ocho wrote a, a manual for Save the Children called Safety First, and then gradually in that period we saw the professionalization of security um, in which many of you or some of you were involved. So we have seen a serious development of security in the sector. And today, if I look at you and if I understand it from my brief spell at ICRC, um, it's a hugely professionalized sector with many dedicated specialists and a lot of investment of time brain power and money going into security. And I think that's how it should be. And then just while we're on history and because it's a bit relevant again, if I look back a hundred years ago, your ancestors in the humanitarian sector in World War I, um, in you know, West Asia, the Middle East, in Europe, 
their main concerns um, actually were dying of disease. And many, if I think of two places, many of the Armenian activists who were um, leading humanitarian resistance activities to support their people who were experiencing genocide at that time, many of them died from typhus um, and other diseases with the displaced people they were trying to help. And the same in Europe, there's one famous example in a displaced camp for Serbian people, where there was an, a Red Cross team of 250 people and 150 of those Red Cross nurses and doctors died of typhus. So security has changed before and it may change again if we don't keep a handle on um, the biological risks, the infectious diseases risks of, of security for staff. So occupational health may be a key part of your agenda going forward, depending or not, as it was for your ancestors. Um, my job is to talk about the big picture, so I'm going to try and do that. I'm going to do three things. I'm going to talk about the geopolitics of security today. Um, I'm going to talk about your humanitarian space and your footprint as I see it. And I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit of ethics at the end. So to start with geopolitics of security today, um, I'm going to raise three things. The reappearance of great powers, the risk of big war and the rise of authoritarianism and the increasing rise of armed violence, political conflict that isn't quite war. So if I start with great powers, one of the big changes in the context that you all live in now is that we are back in a multipolar world. We are through that 20, 30 year period where we had one global superpower and lived under US hegemony. We now have a more 19th century, early 20th century, but more traditional, normal human political world of empires, really, of big powers. So we have China, Russia, the US, Europe, India, um, big powers, and we have regional powers in play as well, as you know. So the landscape has changed. Um, and each of those powers has its own sphere of influence. So depending on where you work, and if you can work will depend on whether you can exist within the sphere of influence of one of those great powers. The second thing I want to raise is big war, because you are at the moment and have been in the last 10, 20 years, mostly working in militarily small wars, counterinsurgency, insurgency, often asymmetric warfare, one part usually with a Western or Russian component of some kind, which has more technological air power kit than the other side. You'll stay in that position, I hope, because in a sense, it's a better scenario. But if you're trying to operate in that world at the moment, that is not the world that militaries are preparing for. Global militaries today are preparing for big war, peer-to-peer -peer warfare, as they call it, near-peer warfare. So if you read the military doctrines of the US, of NATO, of Europe, of China, of Russia, you'll see that the way they see the threats now and the big risks are fighting each other, big war. And if you're sort of largely operating in African um, contexts around West Africa, across the Sahel, in the Horn and other places, and perhaps in Myanmar and the Middle East at the moment, um, and you're focused there, Great power security thinking is focused much more around big trigger points in Ukraine, Taiwan, the Indian Chinese border. If big war arrives in the next 10, 5, 10, 20 years, you will be in a massively different context. There will be huge casualties, um, civilian and military, and a very different environment from the one you're in now. But at the moment, all great powers are naturally, I think, preferring to keep war small, and they are determined at the moment to avoid those clashes where they end up fighting each other. And as a result, they're preferring to operate sub-threshold warfare. So they're preferring to fight and annoy each other and threaten each other and provoke each other and undermine each other under the threshold of tipping into big war. So sub-threshold war is really, in a sense, where 
a lot of the world is at the moment. And that's hybrid warfare, which seeks to stabilize, gradually encroach, to test an enemy, um, to uncouple or trade with or disadvantage the trade of an enemy. And so the great powers are, you know, trying to hold Yemen if you're the West. Um, you've taken Crimea if you're Russia. You've taken back Hong Kong if you're China. And you've taken and held Syria if you're, if you're Russia as well. And you're thinking about taking back Myanmar away from the West as well if you're Russia and China today. So it's that kind of sub-threshold warfare that is in the mind of the great powers, trying to avoid big war, but really all the time getting ready for big war. The next trend we could look at is rising authoritarianism around the world and therefore regrouping democracy. So as authoritarianism rises and is, you know, assumes superpower status in, in, in China, which is, you know, has a particular form of democracy, but not a Western liberal democracy, and it um, is more authoritarian, as is Russia, as is becoming India and Brazil recently as well. Um, and particular African countries, Uganda, Rwanda, and others. We're seeing a rise of authoritarianism and democracy is now trying to regroup, realizing they are the minority potentially at the moment. So we're seeing a security agenda emerging around the regroupment and um, defensiveness almost of democracies. And of course, many areas, and Myanmar would be one, but you know, Hong Kong is another, but there are others and they'll, they'll emerge over the next few years. We'll see an authoritarian government power with a very restless, younger, democratically aspiring youth demography. And that will create extraordinary tensions within those societies. And in a sense, conflicts of dissent and resistance in the way that the Myanmar people are trying to achieve one of those um, successful resistance and dissent movements now. So that will be an increasing context for you in the democracy authoritarianism struggle. And then lastly, in the, the geopolitics, political violence is in many, many places where either governments or the ICRC or others are reluctant to describe a place as in armed conflict, very often people are living in warlike situations, as you know, because of armed violence, because of political violence. And you can see that in Central America, large parts of Nigeria, Pakistan, many, many other places. And in those places and in those dissenting democracy authoritarian struggles, mass protests will be potentially part of the security environment for you and part of the humanitarian response environment for you. So if that's geopolitics, just thinking a little now about your humanitarian space, such as it is at the moment, and the footprint you have around the world. Where are you? And where can you go? And where can you safely go? And here I want to talk a bit about the international system um, and your footprint and the dreaded nexus. So in the international system, we call it the international humanitarian system. It is an international system because it's made up of many states and it's in many states, but it's not a global system. It's a Western system really. So you're not part of a truly global system. You are not in China. You're not in Russia. You're not in India. You're not gonna be in the USA. Um, and a lot of you will not be in Southeast Asia for much longer, I imagine. So you are, in a sense, the Western humanitarian system increasingly going into the future. You are financed and designed by the Western group, or WIOG, as it's called at the UN. And your footprint is and will be increasingly um, confined to the West's sphere of influence. And a, a big open question for you in terms of your footprint is what China decides. How much will China decide to finance your system, your agencies, um, the UN, and how much will it decide to replace it along the Belt and Road Initiative with an internationalizing Chinese Red Cross or with an internationalizing Chinese civil defense system? And what China decides will dictate where you can go in the world, really, and where your 
accepted and respected and where you're not. And the other thing that will decide where you go is how much you effectively engage and support locally led humanitarian action in the next few years. If you really want to enable humanitarian support in different parts of the world, you're gonna to need to localize and invest in local organizations much, much more because they have a chance of staying there. They have to self-determine the future of humanitarian action in their countries. And that's where you should be building. And of course, if you're supporting locally led humanitarian action, that has different forms of security management, security support um, for you as professionals. And of course, the next big thing to say about your footprint and your presence is that it's not just physical. So today, as you know much better than me, physical and digital space are joined and you live physically and digitally at the same time. And your digital space is much bigger now, in a sense, than your physical space. And it is a huge new security zone for you. So the security challenge in the digital space, not just around disinformation, misinformation, um, espionage into your organizations, but also um, around protecting yourselves because your tech is part of your body now and people know where you are because of your tech and it's the same as people you're trying to protect your staff civilians etc that you are now fused in a digital and physical footprint and that's a huge challenge for you going forward it's a great opportunity too i love digital stuff we're doing it now um, so that fusion of digital and physical space is your reality now and then a bit about the nexus, because you're also being asked to work more and more with people beyond your profession, with development agencies, international finance institutions, development organizations. Um, and they have a very different experience of risk and a very different experience of security. They tended to leave usually if there's a security risk and come back later, but they're not gonna do that anymore. So you're often gonna be fused with partners and part of a response system, which has a very different security culture to you, doesn't necessarily relate to you, is more risk averse to you, and doesn't have the professionals that you have. So you're gonna to have to find a relationship in the nexus um, with your development colleagues as well. And that's been shown quite clearly in, in the Tigray operation recently, where most agencies there were development and they, they couldn't kickstart very easily from what I understand from humanitarian outcomes last week. Finally, a bit of ethics. I always feel I have to do a bit of ethics. So three things really. The first thing is it's ethically proper that you should prioritize your people. I truly believe in circles of ethical obligation, expanding circles, and our inner circle of ethical obligation. The people most important for us to protect are our own people. So the principle of protecting and prioritizing your staff's security is an ethically sound one. Our first duties are those duties to those who are closest to us. The second thing, however, is that you also have a security duty and obligation to enable people. So you should not be trying to hold them back you need as security people to let them go and let them work. And for a person to risk their life is at one level their own choice. It's their personal choice. And for many people whose countries this is, you know, if they're working in a war in Nigeria or Yemen or Myanmar, it's their choice about how they want to give their life and risk their life for their country's crisis. So that personal choice is important they should be allowed to make it. Um, but it must be grounded in consent and not coercion. So you know, you always need to be getting consent of people if they're gonna take risks with their lives. You can't force them to do it. You're not the army. Um, and therefore, I, you know, this whole question of outsourcing risk, it's, it's, it's true, it's an issue, you know, the way we work in localization remotely, you're gonna ask people to take risks and you won't because you'll be like me, you'll be in a library somewhere, you know, and talking to them. But it's up to them to take it and they may well want to. 
and you shouldn't prevent them and say it's too dangerous for them and you shouldn't infantilize them and saying oh it's national staff and local staff we sh they shouldn't you know we shouldn't let them take risks we're, we're being irresponsible they're people with political humanitarian often religious commitments to their crises and it's their decision if they take that risk but you have an equal duty of care to national and international staff you have an equal duty to care for them all and mitigate their risks and enable them and protect them as much as you can. The final thing I want to say about ethics is that I think you may in the future, because of this crisis of authoritarianism and democracy, you may end up supporting people who are organizing life-saving against authoritative governments under attack from authoritative governments as civilian movements like Myanmar today. Um, and resistance is an ethical and political duty for us sometimes against great wrongs. But it carries extreme risks to be a resistance humanitarian. And that means working covertly, clandestinely, illegally, often not transparently. And if you are gonna be supporting medical movements, food security movements who are trying to save lives clandestinely, that's a whole new set of security skill set for you. Um, and very different. So you need to be ready if that takes off to work out what it means to support humanitarian resistance movements who are life-saving against a repressive government somehow. So I hope that's helped give a big picture um, on geopolitics, humanitarian footprints, and a bit of ethics. Thank you. Um, that's great. Thank you very much, Hugo. Certainly um, raised a number of issues I think for further discussion. Um, we've had one question in the chat from Celine Laroche. Um, can you say a word on the pervasive narrative on fight against terrorism that is used by authoritarian systems to restrain humanitarian space? Well, the only word I think that I can say, and thank you for that question, is a good one, is that it'll just go on. I think ever since the West decided that the word terrorism you know, it was a trump card which allows you to tell, do anything you like and say that a group was very, very wrong. That's now being picked up by everyone. And, you know, for most governments, a group, a movement, uh, an organization that they don't like will be given the T word and stigmatized in that way, which will make it very difficult for you to either be part of or, um, you know, help. Thank you. And just one other question, I think that we've moved on, which I think has an overlap with that is, um, this is from Zaza, uh, in light of rising totalitarianet, totalitarianet, I can't say that, totality, you know what I'm saying. Get used to saying it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, would localizing of aid um, instead of UN INGO led interventions I mean putting abuse of humanitarian resources at the mercy of these totalitarian governments? Well, it's not a new thing for humanitarians that I mean, we know that, you know, the formal humanitarian system, which tries transparently and with principles of neutrality and impartiality and independence to engage with all warring parties is often under immense pressure um, and of co-option and often very rotten compromises around access and aid and targeting and that will continue. Um, I think what may happen more and more is that you know western organizations just won't get space in places. I think Myanmar is quite an interesting test for that. Now. Great thank you very much. Um, Hugo will be staying with us and will be joining the panel discussion, so we'll have the opportunity to put more questions to Hugo later. Um, I think a couple of key points that were brought up for me was uh, the comments around the digital, and we do have a session later in HNPW about sort of digital and security in the digital world, because we, we can't separate the two anymore, we really have um we need to think about security in one space and the digital and the physical cannot be separated anymore and i think the other thing that i think particularly struck home with me was around your sort of your ethic your ethical obligations um and the fact that security managers need need to let the staff go and i thought that that was a lovely point and 
really it's about making sure that people have enough information so they can make the right decisions. And I think this is something that we've seen a lot in the past is that perhaps information isn't shared and people are not really able to make the right decisions because they're being, as you say, sort of um, dictated to rather than being being allowed to uh, unpack and, and um, decide for their own purposes and their own reasons and their own personal um, level of risk. So thank you very much um, for bringing us this far, Hugo. Um, so the next section, what we'd like to look at is security risk management and what it looks like in the humanitarian sector today and what it might look like in the future. So what we'd like to do is start with a short poll, um, which will be shared by Zoom. It would be great if you could all complete this. Um, it is about gathering perceptions. So there are, for most of the questions, there isn't a right and wrong answer. It's just to understand how you think about this. So I will ask Megan to launch the poll um, and we'll give you a couple of minutes to complete it. So we will leave the poll open to um, so let you finish that off. But I would like to introduce Christine Perso, who will give a short presentation on the evolution of security risk management in the aid sector. Um, while currently Christine now works as a consultant, she has many years of experience working with NGOs and the Red Cross within humanitarian response. She's worked closely with GISF on a number of projects and is the author of our paper on gender and security. Um, so over to you, Christine. Thank you. Um, by no means uh, will this be a, a very detailed uh, historical overview, but certainly, uh, again, it's just a cursory uh, feel of where we've come from and, and where we're hopefully aiming for. So um, I thought I'd, I'd just uh, thank again, um, Mr. Hugo Slim for that, for that first keynote speech and, and bring up the important ethical uh, dimension, uh, because it will relate again to how we anticipate and look at our, our security risk management practices and, and understanding how it's, it's fully integrated throughout the culture. I might, I might just um, have uh, switched the slide right now. Uh, very quickly, um, this is based on available data. I'm sure so many of us have since uh, we first saw one publication, I think it was in 2008, uh, where finally we were teasing out some information about specific context. And again, I go back to the, the notion that this is based on available data, but that again, um, there's certain contexts where the, the security risks are higher. And within that, who is at higher risk? There's a further opportunity for more disaggregated data, of course, to further understand um, the typology and profiles that might be uh, more exposed to security risks. But we know that, again, a lot of our national staff uh, or national counterparts at, are at higher risk. Um, if we go to the next slide, Uh, I do not want to repeat uh, because so much was al already articulated um, during uh, the, the, the opening um, speech, but there are some cross-cutting issues that we are, are still trying to wrap our arms around. It, they're by far not new, and they continue to evolve for the complexity of violence and the proliferation of different actors with their different positions, interests, needs. Um, one of our hope one of the security strategies we aim for is acceptance but again the discussion is going towards well is it acceptance is it tolerance and all of the other um uh you know factors that influence how we're perceived and uh is what we say what we do and again how does that correlate with our safety and security um humanitarian principles which always remain um tested in our evolving operational context and not irrelevant, certainly relevant, but definitely tested. And with that humanitarian imperative, uh, as was uh, also talked about is our changing operational context. And right now with nexus and localization, what does this look like? And um, what does this mean in ter terms of operations and also access? 
go to the next slide very quickly. Um, so what is security risk management? What is it about? Is it prohibitive? Is it risk averse? It's not supposed to be risk averse. And I'm sure we've all heard this before. It's, it's to enable us to do the programming. It, it is to enable us to reach the people that we're trying to help. Um, and with that, there are different frameworks. Uh, frameworks in terms of roles and responsibilities, but frameworks around methodologies. How do we understand the internal context of who we are as an organization and the external context in which we work? So larger geopolitical to the micro, the situation specific. And from there, really tease out um, what, are, what are the specific threats and what is our vulnerability against some of these threats and then that appreciation of risk. So when we're looking at our risk treatment, um, is it appropriate? Is it one that is informed by, again, who we are, what we're trying to do and where we are? So these are definitely part of uh, what the security risk management approach. It is about uh, being able to continue working and working safely. So that's it, not about risk averse. And I would say that um, the, there's risk isn't all bad. Uh, there's, there's always some benefits uh, uh, that we have to weigh. As in crisis, crisis aren't all bad. In crisis comes transformation. So if we look at a, the next slide in terms of um, where we've been and where we're going, um, I'm sure many of you recognize that, that guy there on the left-hand side. Um, but even before that, and I, I do appreciate that it was, there were maybe less formal systems, uh, uh, briefings, there were some regulations, there were codes of conduct, there are and still are, um, that were providing some safety and security. I know in, on some of my first missions, the head of mission was responsible for security. But then, as was mentioned earlier, by the late 90s onwards, you, we saw more of that professionalization. So there was more thinking, more collaboration around training materials or frameworks and methodologies. But with that, um, it attracted a certain profile of former military, either retiring or former police, which is not bad at all, because with that also came other technical expertise and discipline, but sometimes the profile may have not been a good match. Again, it was person dependent, but it went from a very narrow, more a hard security perspective towards the development of more and more tools or um, resources, but then a heavy reliance on checking. So organizations trying to attain, making sure they're, they're attaining their security management responsibilities by just reaching for the minimum, just attaining the minimum, which was, it's not enough. And what we're seeing today, um, which has been very, very exciting, is to see more and more diversity, specifically at the headquarter levels, of uh, people that have security risk management, um, specifically as their responsibilities, having more uh, a dialogue or integrated approach and, and trying to uh, use consultation. There was consultation um, even before, it depended on the organization, but more and more we're recognizing how important that is. Because if we look at that next slide, and this was, um, this was really, uh, when we had written the gender paper, it was looking at a person and what is most visible, what might be less visible. And with the diversity paper that came later on, adapting it, again, to all of the, the different parts of a person, the intersectional profile, the relationship to vulnerabilities, but also to all of the strengths and making sure that our security risk management was actually keeping that in mind, making sure that it considered all of the parts in the diversity of an individual to the teams. So where are we going really is that we need everything. We need, the, we need systems. We need procedures, we need a certain level of discipline, um, but we also need that other component, which is it's, it's always been about people and the complexity that comes with that. And we can't do everything perfect, uh, but certainly one that people can identify with, they're considered, and that, it, that consideration then fulfills within or strengthens what we would consider an organizational culture. So this, um, in the next slide, 
uh, and you can click through all of these. Um, another cross-cutting issue uh, being that when we're considering people, we're also considering all of these other functions and subgroups or subteams within our own in organizations. So inside, some of the best assessments or some of the best work uh, I've ever done around strengthening safety and security uh, risks, our uh, management and systems was when we were working with others, with HR closely, with programs closely, or finance and governance, um, having that opportunity to influence within the organization, and also being able to uh, dialogue and learn from other organizations, be it point to point from a safety and security advisor to another safety and security advisor or HR to HR. There's all of these opportunities for sharing. And then obviously then the other, the other dimension, be it the UN or other government or the private sector, where there's a lot that we could learn from, or again, opportunities for a dialogue. Um, and one example, obviously with the UN is the Saving Lives Together framework. So what does this mean uh, moving forward? And that's our last little slide. Again, not by no means, uh, this is just a, a very cursory look, but should we start talking about from management to leadership and competencies, not one person or one team within an organization, but certainly it's a shared responsibility and there's competencies that we wanna make sure that all roles have in relation to safety and security risk management, be it strategic, operational, or more tactical. Again, at all these layers and has, has so well, so well articulated, um, you know, from an individual management organizational level, all of, again, cross-cutting. Um, so looking at this, this ability to influence and inspire, and again, bring people in a center. So I do want to, uh, again, uh, reflect on, on those important ethical considerations that, um, that, again, how do we keep our people safe so that, again, we can, we can provide the assistance where and, and when it's needed. That's great. Thank you very much, Christine, for a, qu a quick run through um, the history of security risk management in our sector. Um, we are running a bit behind time, but I would like to very quickly share the results of the poll. Um, if we can do that. So quickly, so we have got 43% of the people who filled that in in the security sector, but the important thing is that's more than 50% of people who are not security with their primary function. And this was the hope really of these sessions was to broaden this discussion out and really bring in different ideas, different viewpoints into our way forward. Um, if we look at question two, um, I'm glad only 1% of people thought that it was about providing work for ex-service personnel. Um, and again, 50-50. And it, for me, it is about enabling program delivery with just a bit just behind it, keeping staff safe. So, so it is that mix between those two. Question three. Um, first incorporated into the project cycle. I would say this should be in the assessment phase, again, from my opinion, design. Really glad that very few people thought it was about implementation because this is where we get into a lot of problems is that we haven't thought about these issues in, in the early stages. Um, where should costs be incorporated? I mean, this is really interesting at how much this is spread quite evenly between those four points, because this is one area that we really struggle with. Um, and we'll be discussing more around this, I think, with Fergus and his perspective from, from the FCDO. Question five, primary responsibility. Again, some mix and different organizations have different approaches to this. Some work in different organizations to others. So it's really, um, again, this fact that it's not one size fits all. Um, organized question six around safeguarding, the majority yes. Um, we know in some organizations and some people feel that this isn't something that is within the security remit, but I think certainly most of the security managers we deal with think it's really important that we do tackle internal um, and safeguarding 
uh, threats as well as ones external to the organization. Question seven, um, some interesting responses around the personal factor and security. Um, question eight on the organizational factor, organizational culture, really interesting because it's obviously the hardest one to achieve. Um, so that gives us an idea of where we need to be working on. Um, the context factor, which has most um, impact, uh, knowledge and understanding of the context. Again, that flags to us something that we should be better at doing perhaps around analysis and sharing information on the context. And finally, question 10, um, the departments which should be included. Um, my answer to this one is, is it should be everybody, but it, it is quite difficult at times to really engage. And, and particularly GISF has been working recently with members of sort of the advocacy departments to see how we can bring security and advocacy closer together, particularly with some of the, um, the campaigns that are going on at the moment um, around not a target and protecting aid workers. So that's great. Thank you very much for your inputs on those. And we will see what that means as we move forward um, as part of the um, as part of the panel discussion. So if we go on to the panel, um, so as well as Hugo and Christine, so I said we have Fadi Haliso. Um, so Fadi has been one of the main contributors to the work of GISF um, recently, particularly as we do the work around um, security risk management with local partner organisations. Um, and our other speaker, Fergus Thomas, he is a humanitarian who now works in the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. He's quite keen to point out he is still a humanitarian, despite working for the government. Um, and he is a strong advocate for ensuring the importance of security risk management in humanitarian response is and is recognized by donors. So I'd like to pose the first question to Fadi. Um, Christine has given us an overview of security risk management in the humanitarian sector. However, there is often a perception that security risk management for is, interna is for international organizations and international staff only. National staff often consider the rules to be too onerous or not context specific enough for them. And internationals often assume that national colleagues know the country, so will not be at risk. This difference seems to be even more stark when there is a local partner organization and risk transfer is seen as the acceptable way for an INGO to manage their risks. As you work for a national organization that's working in, in Lebanon and Syria, so one of the most high risk areas of humanitarian action at the moment, how do you see the issue of security risks in humanitarian response? Thank you for having me on this panel. I'm glad to participate as always, although this is my first time this year I'm talking about risk management. So it is. it seems trendy this year as uh, we see many trends in this sector. But I hope this trend might bring uh, some real change because from our perspective, the point was really, the situation was really disappoint, uh, disappointing. Uh, yes, I think in uh, Hugo's uh, intervention and Christine uh, presentation, there were a lot of uh, points about uh, how local organizations suffer with the issue of risk management. Often you are right. For us, uh, the requirements of international organizations, uh, our partners or our donors seems quite uh, um, coming from another planet. Uh, for people working uh, here on the ground in Syria, um, it seems as if it were put, they were put for different people. Um, and we don't understand, often understand how we can comply with these rules when we are starved from resources as local organization, when we are treated as most of the time as uh, subcontractors 
to implement already good set of uh, programs and uh, goals and we have no saying in the design of the programs um, and we are even uh, every we are negotiated on every single line of the budget so we have very little room uh, to uh, design our own for our own safety this is on one hand on the other hand it seems sometimes that um, sometimes uh, partners and organizations are happy just to divert the risk to the local partner they withdraw their uh, staff from our areas when it is too risky. We've seen this in Syria when uh, ISIS and Nusra Front uh, emerged. Uh, all international organization withdrew to the safety of Turkey and ASEAN. Uh, so only local staff remained on the ground with very little support. And we've seen, especially in the first uh, year, months of uh, ISIS emergence, we've seen many uh, local staff members being killed on the spot by extremists. Um, the same when they are when they were fell victim for uh, the targeting of the regime. And until now, the international community is not able to provide any safety for uh, humanitarian workers in Syria. Last month, we had a hospital that uh, got bombarded by airplanes, even though the hospital was. Uh, part of the demilitarizing uh, plan that was shared with the UN and the Russians. It was uh, funded by the, by the UN and international donors funds to be bunkered. It, wa it was an underground hospital uh, that was bunkered. So most of the time, these talk about security management seems uh, as if happening in another planet and does not really affect us on the ground. Um, and this is disappointing. So, and uh, it is disappointing also to not have enough support from uh, partners and donors, uh, especially with these circumstances. Um, I have many examples when we had to negotiate for months when some of our staffs were killed to support their, continue supporting their families or when they had to be displaced to other parts of the country to give them allowance so they can restart their life again in an area where they have no, uh, no one, uh, they know where they have no roots. So all of this uh, is uh, our very difficult history of the last 10 years. But there is a progress. I can't say uh, that uh, there is no progress at all, but it is a very slow one. And mostly it is uh, driven by initiatives of individuals in uh, partners organization. There is no, we, I, can, I can't say that I am seeing a real change in the mentality to deal with risk uh, management with the local organizations. This needs a political decision, a political will on, from donors, agencies, and government to divert real support for local organizations in terms of uh, uh, risk management. I hope this is not a trend, just like the localization was a few years ago in uh, Istanbul World Humanitarian Summit, and uh, today, after like uh, six or seven years, the progress on localization is very little compared to the high hopes we had at the time. Uh, I hope we see real progress where uh, local uh, organizations are included in the discussion, in the dialogue about how to move forward, about what their needs to, uh, in the years to come. That's great. Thank you, Fadi. And I think you make a very good point there about, you know, making sure that we move this from um, rhetoric to action. Um, so I'd like to pose a question to Fergus. Um, Organisations often cite lack of resources as a significant factor for not implementing effective security risk management practices. The FCDO has recognised for a while now the importance of having a specific budget line for security in proposals. If organizations are struggling to get donors to accept security costs, what would your advice be to them? Mm 
I know Fergus was struggling with his connection earlier, so I'm hoping that he can hear us and is able to answer. Um, okay, so Fergus, can you hear me now? No, nope, he's gone again. Okay, so um, what I would like to do then while we're waiting for Fergus, we haven't had any questions in from any of the participants yet. So are there any questions that you would like to ask to each other amongst the panel? Well, Lisa, I know, here's Christine. Um, I know that part of some of the prep that we had um, discussed in with this panel was looking at what would be, would be some challenges and opportunities um, around security risk management. And I don't know if it's, if it's worth um, maybe just giving a few insights around that, if that's okay. Um, and again, not by no means to be repetitive, but certainly again, um, some of the, the challenges, again, going around access and the efforts and going further into those last mile last mile locations where where um, we can if we can safely access them and again for principled um, principled humanitarian assistance um, one of the worries I've had is has been around risk and and uh, that risk uh, reputational risks and legal liability are often a driver and again how do we shift that back to people and um, ag again these opportunities around learning from and strengthening local capacities. And I mean learning from them because uh, from past experience, um, working with local implementing partners, just the opportunity to listen to some of their own uh, resilience and strategies that are absolutely wonderful and maybe providing additional um, you know, methods, methodology or, or other frameworks has, has been helpful. But I, I do see that as, as a really important um, opportunity along with organizational culture. And I think we mentioned that a lot. And what does it mean? And I know there's a complexity to this. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge cross-cutting complexity in terms of individuals and, and all of the, the different parts or beliefs that we bring to that and within a team and within a program right to governance. So I do think that those are areas of, of further, um, further uh, you know, more discussion and to improve and how HR plays a very important role in that uh, constellation. So, and then I think just a few opportunities too. I think um, uh, I, I, a lot of these issues we've tackled over the years, they were in our view, you know, 20 years ago, 17 years ago, but it wasn't until something more like a scandal would occur and then more resources or attention were drawn there. So again, um, I think that it shouldn't be just reputational risks that are driving, but always being a few steps ahead and anticipating again, how are, uh, you know, what, what does the profile of, of war look like or, uh, or people and how we're evolving. And, and again, these different uh, ways of operating in certain contexts. So I thought I would just throw that in as, as again, there's so many different types of opportunities. Great, thank you very much, Christine. I'm hoping now that Fergus can hear me. Fergus, are you there? Great. So um, I'll ask that question again. Um, so organizations often cite lack of resources as a significant factor for not impl implementing effective security risk management. So the FCDO has recognized for a while now um, the importance and have a specific budget line for security and proposals. If organizations are struggling to get donors to accept security costs, what would your advice to them be? I think um, donors need to be lobbied and I think donors need to understand how important this is. Can you hear me okay? Is it okay? Yes, I'm we not can. breaking up. Great, fantastic. Donors are very, very risk averse. So uh, I loved Christina's um, presentation where she was saying that uh, security risk management isn't about risk aversion. We on the donor side are extremely worried about taking any kind of risk and spend 
a lot of our time working out risk management strategies. Um, and for us, um, security risk management is, is definitely in Lisa's camp. Um, it's all about ensuring program delivery. Um, so I think it's, it, it's about understanding the, the, the donor's appetite for risk and uh, reasoning really that uh, good security risk management is a surefire way to ensure that we not only deliver effective programming, um, but we do that in a way that doesn't harm um, the, the life and limb of, of, of uh, our people on the ground and does not cause uh, reputational risk uh, damage to, to the donor who is funding. So I think it's understanding that mentality, that, 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 that position and putting pressure and pointing to some of the best practices. GASF has done a great deal of work um, to work with donors to, to establish best practice in SRM and has produced a really useful resource um, that we've started to use a lot, um, which is uh, uh, about the cost of SRM um, to help us understand the dimensions of what, in fact, it means to um, reasonably manage the risks of security um, in, in any given context. And so that's a really pragmatic toolkit, um, which you can point your donors to. Um, and please take our name um, of, of FCDO. We have um, allowed our uh, funded humanitarian partners to have a specific budget line in direct program costs. Uh, so this is not part of the, you know, the indirect cost recovery or the headquarters cost. This is within your program. You should be budgeting for adequate uh, infrastructure, adequate human resources and adequate training um, in security risk management. Security contexts are so diverse and so uh, heterogeneous and so complex and so unpredictable, but security risk management methodologies and approaches are not. And we can actually quite, I think, effectively and easily manage security risks by applying the thinking and the best practice um, that, that we've been developing over the last 20 years as a community. Um, so I, I think it's, I think it is about that. Keep, hold us to account and, um, and look at, the best practices out there, and I think that they'll share. Um, the GSF can share in the sidebar there the um, the, the the document on um, the costings for risk management. Thanks, Lisa. Great, thank you very much, Fergus. Um, we have a couple of questions in which I think we have time to look at, which I think um, are linked. And um, first one from Katrina. How do you balance organisational risk threshold and individual thresholds? Um, in connection with duty of care and ethics. And I think this was the second question that came in um, with growing attention to identity, um, identity base, so SOGI, race, ethnicity, et cetera. How should organizations evolve their security risk management methodologies and frameworks? Um, anybody like to have a go at that one? Hugo. Well, I'm happy to, I think it's a very, very good question um, from Katerina about the balance of organizational risk and individual thresholds. And, you know, there's no immediate answer to that. Um, all organizations develop their own culture, they attract certain kinds of people, they exude an ethos. Um, and some are more uh, risk averse than others. And tend to attract those sort of peoples, but also, so organizations set their own culture, which is a balance of people, people and governance, as it were. But also every organization has different people in it. And, you know, it's a reality that there are some people that prefer different kinds of jobs. And so you can also achieve the balance by realistically finding the sort of people who are more at ease, have a lower pulse rate. I mean, I would be hopeless, you know, because I get so stressy about anything. So, you know, you wouldn't put me out there in a, in a more dangerous place. Um, but there are other people that you, you would and they'd say, yeah, I'm happy with that. That's where I like to be. So I think you can find a balance with personalities as well within, within an organization. And you should use it. You know, we all need different people to play different parts. And, um, and I think that's how, one of the ways you do it. But again, you know, you, you ask them if they're happy to do it and you say, well, okay, we're happy you do that. But, you know, Fergus is very kindly going to spend millions of pounds on keeping you safe as well. So we'll give you what you need. So uh, you balance it with Fergus's investment as well. 
great thank you um anybody else like to comment on the on those two questions Adi? yes i think uh, this is very important uh, question uh, and for uh, local organization it is always a debate of course we and sometimes we can't convene uh, really to our donors why we are uh, so risk takers um, sometimes we feel paralyzed by their conditions, but you can tell you know, for Syrians, it is, it is their own people they are working with. It is their own parents and families. If they don't take risk, they will starve. If they don't, don't take risk, uh, you know, they will die uh, waiting for medical help to arrive. Uh, so taking a risk for field workers, you know, I'm uh, in a spot similar to Hugo's. Uh, I am in the safety of our headquarters in Beirut for different political reasons. I haven't been able to go back to Syria in the last 10 years. Uh, so I, I find myself in a similar spot and I can't tell, I can't tell our field staff, uh, please uh, don't make these risks when it is their uh, own families on the line. Uh, of course, we are not happy to lose anyone. And we have lost many uh, staff members in the last few years, but uh, it, it was uh, their choice and our choice as an organization to say to stay true to our cause, to our uh, uh, nature of work in a very volatile environment in uh, conflict that hasn't uh, that was so violent. So. And uh, the problem is that uh, this is something that is not easy to convey to outside owners. And we often find questions uh, coming in the risk assessment of any project or proposal that are really impossible to answer. Like what you would do to ensure that no one, uh, that the warehouse is not shelled. And what we would do, there is no insurance. We had bunkered uh, schools that were uh, bombarded and for just by the pure luck, no one was hurt. So um, it is, I don't think anyone has a magical formula to find this balance. Uh, there, there is always uh, uh, what your heart and, uh, tell, you, tell you to do after making all the right uh, uh, precaution measures uh, possible. But at the end, this is an environment that we, we require us to make, uh, to take risks. Thank you, Fadi. Um, Christine, do you want to add anything to that? You know, no, I, I deeply appreciate there. I mean, those thresholds are two separate things. Um, however, there are opportunities around, if we look at the employment life cycle, I don't mean to be too, too narrow, but there's these opportunities for that inclusive approach of having conversations right from, or how do we communicate um, maybe the organizational risk culture or thresholds from the beginning. But I do, uh, I do, I do go back to um, what Fadi mentioned around, you know, how some people are compelled and, and they are willing to take other risks and that's, that's part of their decision. Um, and then the organizational responsibility to inform them. But again, looking at, you know, learning is ongoing. Uh, we, we talk about trainings and other opportunities for having conversations and checking in, but it's always ongoing on, on all sides. But I, I see two separate, two, two very separate thresholds. And sometimes we just have to, from an individual organizational um, level, make sure, well, can they, they're never gonna match. Nothing is ever perfect. Um, but do they, you know, is, 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 a be, is it a better fit for who we work? And, um, and then obviously in our lifetime, it changes, our individual threshold changes and organizational, also, or from organizational perspectives, they can change depending on competition or the environment or changes in strategy. So it's, again, it's not a one size fit all, fits all, but I think what we can go back to again, when we're looking at this is about people is how, how we can attend to all of the different parts of you know, uh, recruitment or induction and, and all of the learning and accompanying them and, and getting the input and adjusting. And I, I go back again to it's, it's at so many levels um, from governance to, to individual, but 
it's one that we have to pay attention to um, very closely. I'm not sure if that makes any sense, but I, it's, I certainly agree with, with Hugo and Fadi on, on so many issues. Great, thank you. Um, Fergus, do you want to add anything to that? Not, not, not really. Maybe just to, to 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 say that we we for any sustainable, durable security management systems, um, we 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 think um, wherever possible to to base it on the acceptance model and the acceptance um, strategy, and that necessarily means bringing everyone to the table, spending the right amount of time with communities as you design programming, as you uh, as you um, as you consider the needs assessment, as you build up trust and confidence, because that is going to be the most durable uh, solution, and that that puts international staff and national staff on a complete par. So I think that that's that's you know the very much the kind of the strategy that we we see as being the most sustainable. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have run out of time for this component of this session. There are a number of questions that have come into the chat. What I will do is talk to my colleagues, Laura and Megan, who are the technical experts. We will look at how we can answer these um, on the exhibition site at HPNW. So we'll go through these questions and we will develop some written answers and we'll share this through the exhibition page. Somebody also asked about the, um, the poll results and we can share those as well through that site. So just for the last few minutes that we have in the session, as I said, we would like to get your input um, into the process and where we go from here. So what we're going to do is break you into small groups probably around four people. So we all have experience now of Zoom as to what might happen, but so groups around four to five people. And what we'd like you to do is to identify at least one action that could improve security risk management in the humanitarian sector. What are the practical steps just to make a small change? to move us towards some of the things and to tackle some of the issues that our speakers today have been speaking about. Um, some of the perceptions that were identified during the poll. So what we'll do is, um, Laura, will send you out into small groups. If you could discuss amongst yourselves this question, um, and when you come back into plenary, if you can um, add your comments, your suggestions, the identified actions into the chat, um, and then we will compile all of this information afterwards. Please don't put the information into the chat when you're in the group, because then it only stays with your group and the rest of us can't see it when we're in plenary. So that's what we'd like you to do. Um, so I'll ask Laura to send everybody into their groups now. Okay, um, is that everybody back? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Okay, so there are some faces that I recognise in the crowd who I will pick on. So um, I see Christina Weiler there. What did you talk about in your group? Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Um, we didn't have all that much time, so I hope we didn't actually miss any important contributions. But in terms of what we talked about was the importance of training and the training pre-deployment and the constant training and then it also came up that it's really important to listen to the experiences of national staff and that maybe some training is too much focus on the experience of expatriate staff and that um, there is a need to think about training for local staff and probably local partner organizations. I think that was in essence it. If anyone from my group wants to come in, please do. Great, thank you, Christina. Um, and for everybody, do please make your comments of the discussions in the chat 
um, because it would be really useful for us to see what it is that you identified. Um, that would be great. Um, is Caroline, Caroline Neal, are you there? Saw you earlier. I am indeed. Great. Caroline, what were you talking about? Yeah, so, so um, the, the main one, I, I guess, was that security is inclusive of the field staff and that international staff actually listen to field staff and ask them what they what they need from the international maybe headquarters, um, what they really want, rather than trying to impose security protocols on them, which, you know, which may not work in, in, the, in the scenario or the, um, or the country or the region or the program that, that, they're, that they're operating in. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good point. And I think we often, th this idea of one size fits all is yeah. something that we often struggle with. And I know the, the session later in the week around a person centered approach to security is really trying to pick up that idea um, that we need to make it appropriate to everybody and, and really have an opportunity to hear their voices. And I know Hugo mentioned it in his presentation that that of ability to listen is yeah. so important. And the staff have different needs, you know, and you can't just assume that everybody has the same need just because it may affect you in a particular way. You know, and really, I, I guess active listening was the, was our overriding summary. Great, thank you, Caroline. Um, and Sean Denson, what were you uh, talking about? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. So our, our group uh, talked a little bit like Christine just said, uh, talked about reducing complexity. Uh, we think that there's just too much reliance on technical solutions and in some ways that takes away from the human element. And it's really those closer relationships that, that really uh, produce good security outcomes. So that was an important part. We also talked a little bit about being more integrated. So security being part of its organization, but also engaging more closely with communities, understanding the communities, understanding uh, context that's, that makes it more, more relevant uh, on both counts. And then also, also being prepared to change your plan. I mean, so often, you know, there's there's a lack of agility because, you know, you, you you start with a plan and then you just stick rigidly to it with, you know, in the face of all evidence that suggests that you should be uh, changing things as you go. So, a, a confidence to be able to change as well. That's what we had. That's great. Thank you, Sean. Um, and and I think that that idea of flexibility. And as um, Christine mentioned in her presentation, that sort of checkbox exercise that we were stuck in for a long time, which often sort of rules out the flexibility that we require. Um, well, thank you very much um, and for everybody's contributions in the chat. And I think what we do, will do again is we'll work out how we can share these and we'll produce a document um, which will be in the exhibition stand. Um, so just before I wrap up, I would like to just share. So let's see if I can share my screen. Um, so hopefully you are seeing the, um, the, the sessions that we've got coming up um, in the rest of the HNPW program. Um, so we've got one around sort of sharing risks, building stronger partnerships. So this is really unpacking further some of these comments Fadi was making um, and about how do we really bring in the local organizations into the conversation. Um, and we've got sessions on acceptance and access. So the session um, is led by Larissa Fast um, from Manchester University. And that's really sort of looking at, you know, what does acceptance mean in this changing sort of humanitarian context? Um, as I mentioned before, managing security risks in the digital world. How do we bring this conversation around digital and physical security together? Um, and then um, the person centered approach to security risk management and humanitarian response, you know, really bringing some of the factors that we were talking about um, in this afternoon session. There's one other session in there, which is around the role of donors with security risk management. This is being um, chaired by Estonia, um, our colleagues from Estonia. 
Um, this is invite only, but if anybody's interested um, from that donor perspective in joining that, do please drop um, myself or Fergus um, a line. Uh, now, can I move slides on? Yes. Um, so we've mentioned the exhibition space. This is on the HNPW website. If you click um, the exhibition, you will find um, the GISF page. There's these sort of open interactive sessions. These are just sort of drop in moments. If you want to find out more about security risk management, if you want to find out more about GISF do come and see us. Um, the timings are all on the website. So on that note, um, as we come to an end, I will stop sharing my screen, hopefully. Um, no, cannot there. <laughs> stop sharing now. Stop sharing. Thank you very much, Laura. <laughs> this is why we have somebody else doing the, um, the logistics and the technical stuff for this workshop. I would like to thank very much um, our four speakers, to Hugo, uh, to Faddy, to Christine and to Fergus. Um, I know he's very embarrassed that the internet in London was the one that let us down. Um, and also thank you very much to everybody else who has joined for your contributions. I do hope you will stay, stay engaged with the conversation. Um, so thank you very much and hope to see you again through the rest of HNPW. Thank you. Thank you.